thank you for that uh, kind introduction. It's uh, good to see all of you here, and I thank you, especially the veterans who, who are here. Uh, I'm a believer uh, that stories have a lot of power, uh, and we need to tell those stories over and over again. So our story today on this Veterans Day begins on June 5th, 1924. If you're old enough to remember picking up the Des Moines Register along with the fresh milk that morning, you certainly remember the headline screaming across the front page. GOP gives up plan to aid farmers. 15,000 dope addicts said to be in Iowa. Billy Sunday plans to attack the devil again. And the South Dakota governor says gas in Iowa is too high. Speaking in Cedar Rapids, Governor McMaster of South Dakota, the man who broke the back of the gasoline trust, said Iowans are paying three cents a gallon too much for gasoline. He said the little war he had waged in his state had brought the price down and had kept it down to 18 cents a gallon, minus, of course, the state tax. Here in West Branch, I'm sure uh, that news had Sam Jeffries and Stubb Rummels considering their next gas war on West Main. Of course, there was other news of seemingly little consequence on June 5th, 1924. For example, Donald Edward Hansen was born in Cedar Falls, Iowa. He's an, an example of a new generation being born in the dark shadows and the bloody cost of World War I, the Great War, the war to end all wars. On this Veterans Day 2016, let's follow the young Hanson boy as a member of what Tom Brokaw called, and now we all call, the greatest generation. Little Donald would grow up like the millions of others who would later become common soldiers with uncommon stories to tell and deserve to be retold. President Herbert Hoover, as we all know, was orphaned, and he and Donald Hansen would share that experience. Now, this comes from a personal history written by a West Branch uh, man, who we'll find out about him a little bit later, but I just want to read from his remembrances. Emma and I had been married for over five years, and yet had no children. Our Lutheran Synod held its annual meeting every year in Elkhorn, Iowa, in September. Mr. and Mrs. N.P. Pete Olson, who operated a garage and implement store in West Branch, were very active in church work. Mr. Olson had been president of the congregation for several years and almost always attended the annual meeting in Elkhorn. The Sunday before the meeting in 1925, we were asked to their home for Sunday dinner. And while there, we were asked if we would like to go along to the convention. I said I was sure we would, but at that time, I had been hired to operate the silage cutter and that it would be in operation at that time. I did say to Emma that I would like for her to go. She said no. She didn't want to go without me. As I tried to encourage her, she said, do you realize that we have been married over five years and never once have been separated overnight? I said no. I hadn't realized that, but that it would have to happen sometime. Something had taken place within herself, she said, that she was unable to explain. She said she didn't want to go, but there was an urge from within her to say, you should go. She kept fighting with this urge until Thursday morning at the time she was to let the Olsons know of her decision. I said to her that morning, are you calling the Olsons to tell them that you've decided to go? And she answered she didn't want to go without me, but that the urge had become even stronger. I said, Emma, there must be a reason, so I would like for you to go. So she called the Olsons to tell them that she'd be there. My sister Jackie was married to Chris Hansen, the baker from Denmark. They had two boys, Richard and Donald. At the time, Richard was living with my folks, but we had never known what had become of Donald. The Olsons and Emma arrived in Elkhorn on Friday and were given lodging with members of the church. Saturday morning, they attended a business session, but no session was scheduled for that afternoon. Mr. and Mrs. Olson asked Emma if she would like to go to the children's home to look around. The Synod had both a children's orphanage and an old people's home in Elkhorn. The room they entered was a rather large room with a post in the center from the floor to the ceiling. Alongside this post was a chubby, red-haired red boy playing with some toys. Emma, gasping for breath, said, that's Donald. The Olsons asked her, Donald who? She said, that's Henry's sister's baby. And none of the family knew where he was, what she had done with him. We later learned that Jackie worked in Des Moines, which was midway between West Branch and Elkhorn, and that she was paying the home for taking care of him. 
Emma then said, now I know why I had that urge within me. This was, has been divine guidance, and I am to take care of Donald and, and give him a home. I called my sister in Des Moines, Jackie, and explained to her what we thought was a un very unusual experience, believing Emma had been prompted by the Holy Spirit to go to Elkhorn with the Olsons. My sister promised to take the bus to Iowa City at a certain time where we picked her up. After some discussions, she said, I will give you permission to take him, but with one stipulation. His name was Donald E. Hansen, and she didn't want us to change his name, and she said, I promise I will never interfere with you raising him, as I know you will give him a better home than I will ever be able to. We drove to Alcorn and, and brought Donald home a few days later. That was the latter part of September of 1925, so he was nearly 16 months old. Now that's, uh, that's taken from a personal history uh, that, that's titled Sown to Clover uh, by Henry A. Johnson, who is my, uh, happens to be my adoptive uh, grandfather. And if, if uh, you haven't tried, you know, connected the dots yet, you soon will. They called him Red Hansen with that shock of ruby hair typical of a Dane. You know, one of the stories about Donald Hansen uh, that still is, I believe, is in the record books. They used to have a soapbox derby here in West Branch, and they, they'd start those, uh, you know, uh, home-built cars uh, up uh, at the top of Downey Street, at, at where College Street uh, uh, forms a T, right where the old schools used to be, the schools that I attended and some of you attended. And uh, so uh, he and a friend got an old baby carriage and, and, and just stripped it of everything except pretty much the wheels and the frame, put a couple planks on it, a rope, on each side, of, you know, on each front wheel, just for steering, and Dad hopped on top. He was a chubby little boy. And there was an announcer down at Maine and Downey, and uh, uh, the announcer was shouting uh, as, as Donald Hansen was taking the lead and, and said, he's across Main Street, he's going all the way to Downey. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody had ever in the soapbox derby gone farther than the birthplace cottage of Herbert Hoover. And he made it all the way there. And so he was front page news in the West Branch Times. <laughs> After graduating from West Branch High School and beginning to study at Iowa State College, he enlisted in the United States Army in December of 1942. By 1944, he was on his way to Europe as part of General George Patton's 3rd Army, 89th Division, Cannon Company, Frontline Artillery. Donald Hansen would be awarded the Bronze Star and the Purple Heart. He returned to West Branch joining Grandpa Henry's businesses, changed his last name from Hanson to Johnson, and married a beautiful Cedar Bluff girl, Mary Jean Suckamel, who is in our audience today. And Mother, would you just stand, wave, wave your hand or stand up? <laughs> so glad to have her here today. Mother of ten, by the way. Some of you might know the rest of his story. Um, uh, city Council, Chamber of Commerce, rising through the ranks of the American Legion, including election as National Commander in 1964. Uh, he ran a spirited campaign to win the Republican nomination for governor in 1968, which was won by the beloved Robert D. Ray. The next year, a presidential appointment came uh, from the Nixon administration as head of the Veterans Administration, and as was noted earlier, uh, uh, an, an agency that was put together by uh, President Hoover. Uh, uh, he held that post uh, at the VA from 1969 to 1974. He did service in the Ford, Reagan, and Bush administrations. Uh, Chief of Staff for former uh, US, Iowa U.S. Senator Roger Jepson. And finally, Executive Director of the National Credit Union Administration until his retirement in 1993. He joined the Hoover Foundation in 1972 as a member, served on that board of directors uh, for a long period of time, including as president from 1977 to 1983. Of course, I'm proud of my dad's record, but again, he's just an example, just one example of millions of common soldiers, good soldiers, who accomplished uncommon things in the absolute horror of Nazi Germany and the Japanese imperialism in the Pacific. For the 89th Infantry, the Rolling W, uh, perhaps the one date most seared to the memory of their fighting campaign across Europe, came on April 4, 1945. As the Allies broke through across the Rhine and into Germany, 
Bruce Nichols, a member of the 89, remembers being on patrol near the town of Ordruf in Germany. In his own words, As I recall, it was a beautiful spring morning marred by the fact that we were under mortar attack. I remember very well my surprise when I observed Brigadier General Robertson strolling upright down the road. He was an elderly, avuncular gentleman who thought nonchalance under fire characterized the general officer's role model. I was impressed but remained prone in the drainage ditch until the attack ceased. <laughs> Shortly thereafter, an acquaintance let it be known that a camp had been liberated further up the hill. Fifty years have passed since this day, but I recall my first impression of the camp called Ordruf, which I found later was associated administratively with a camp called Buchenwald. Ordruf was named after the town of the same name, apparently locally famous for its history of being the place where Johann Sebastian Bach composed some of his works. From the outside, the camp was unremarkable. It was surrounded by a high barbed wire fence, the swinging gate was open and a young soldier, probably an SS guard, lay dead diagonally across the entrance. The camp was located in the forest and was surrounded by a thick grove of pines and other conifers. The inside of the camp was composed of a large 100-yard square central area which was surrounded by one-story barracks painted green, which appeared to house somewhere between 60 and 100 inmates. As we stepped into the compound, one was greeted by an overpowering odor of quick lime, dirty clothing, feces, and urine. Lying in the center of the square were 60 to 70 dead prisoners clad in striped clothing and in disarray. They had reportedly been machine gunned the day before because they were too weak to march to another camp. The idea was for the SS and the prisoners to avoid the approaching U.S. Army and the Russian forces. Adjacent to the parade ground was a small shed which was open on one side. Inside were bodies stacked in alternate, alternate directions as one would stack cordwood, and each layer was covered with a sprinkling of quicklime. I did not see him, but someone told me that there had been a body of a dead American aviator in the shed. This place reportedly had been used for punishment, and the inmates were beaten on their back and heads with a shovel. My understanding is that all died following this abuse. I visited some of the surrounding barracks and found live inmates who had hidden during the massacre. They were astounded and appeared to be struggling to understand what was happening. Some were in their five-tier bunks and some were wandering about. This was the first camp to be liberated by the Allied armies in Germany. Ordruf was visited by Generals Eisenhower, Patton, and Bradley, and there were are photographs of them observing the bodies of the machine-gunned inmates. According to Eisenhower, Patton had refused to visit the punishment shed as he feared he would become ill. He did vomit at a later time. Further into the camp was evidence of an attempt to exhume and burn large numbers of bodies. There was a gallows, although I really cannot remember whether I saw it or not. I don't remember leaving the camp. I recall being numb after seeing the camp. I had just turned 20 years old, and I had read the biographical Out of the Night. It was a pale and inadequate picture of a German concentration camp by a refugee German author. I recall becoming very upset when we got back to our quarters, but the whole experience was far beyond my understanding. I wrote a letter to my parents describing the experience, which was read at a local gathering of businesses. It was widely disbelieved. The survivors, uh, their stories need to be remembered as well. Uh, there's certainly a lot of information uh, that's available on the 89th uh, Infantry Society website. Uh, Fifty years after his liberation from Ordruf, Andrew Rosner uh, spoke in Kansas City uh, on April 23, <coughs> 1945. The fiftieth anniversary of the liberation of Ordrup that month, and it speaks many vines, many, many vines. And you just take this. What you, my liberators, did in nineteen forty five <coughs> represented all that was good and kind in the world. Had it not been for your goodness and kindness and compassion, I would have died. I would have died. The world would have died. So 
uh, if you go to the uh, Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., uh, which is a very intense ex experience, you'll, you'll find uh, lots of references to Orbit <coughs> here. And again, it was not, it, it was not the worst that uh, uh, any of the Allies would see. And so the, a lot of the more information there, eyewitness accounts, both from survivors and from the liberators, are there. It was a work camp. Orders was a work camp, not an extermination camp. But the difference is difficult to discern, it says on the website. Prisoners were literally worked to death and disposed of by burning and incinerators, which was the most cost-effective method. As the Allies approached, panic set in for the guards. Those inmates who couldn't walk were shot. Others were forced to march toward a safe haven, with most of them dying in the effort. It was a horrible and unbelievable scene, <coughs> which seared its way into one's memory. Almost 50 years after uh, World War II ended, veterans of the 89th Infantry and their families visited France and Germany as part of our final tour of remembrance. Towards the end of our trip, we visited Ordruf, and to our su surprise, found nothing absolutely nothing. All the traces of it had disappeared. There's only a graveyard for POWs in a German army training camp. It was like it never existed. But it did, and we can testify to it personally. Most Germans today were not even born then, but we pray that the German people never let future generations forget what a mad, mad regime can do. Well, I happened to be on that trip, and it was absolutely true. Uh, we got to Ordruf, to the town, and there is a German training uh, camp near there. And we were supposed to be met by those who would direct us to the location of the camp. The two charter buses that we had, uh, with, with the veterans of the 89th, uh, their, some, their spouses, uh, and uh, some of my generation who, did, who decided to go along, and that's a story in and of itself, uh, you know, we were waiting there, waiting there, waiting there as someone was trying to get attention to have somebody come to the gate. The gate was locked and closed and there was nobody there. Well, finally somebody came out of one of the barracks and didn't have any knowledge of, of any type of concentration camp having ever been around Ordre. Uh But they were, but that uh, everybody was welcome to, uh, on this very gray day, I remember it very clearly, uh, of where it exactly was. So uh, the, we, we took the buses uh, to a, a drop-off spot and to see these veterans and their spouses, if they could, go up and down these hills with very little in the way of trails. And I was walking along a veteran by the name of Eldon Johnson, no relation whatsoever, but we had kind of gotten to know each other during this trip uh, across Europe. We started in Normandy and headed east, and um, all of a sudden he just stopped, looked around, and said, it was right here. It was right here. And that's all that he could say. It was right here. And he, you, know, you could see the outline of the, of the, the church spires and the buildings in order of, uh, off in the distance. And uh, when we got back on the buses, at least on our bus, and I'm sure in the other bus too, these veterans had to just tell their stories. They just were totally uh, overwhelmed that, that there was nobody there to, to meet them, nobody there that had any knowledge of that camp. And it, it is true. I decided to leave uh, the group, hop on a train, and go down to Munich, which was going to be our last stop, uh, to the south of where, where we were in, when, we, when we went further east. And I wanted to go to Dachau. And I wanted to see it for myself. And there were I would, what I would call skinheads there, saying it never happened. I mean, at the front to Dacha, where, where the barracks are gone, but it's a very, very interesting place um, uh, to stand there and know that it was, it was this, this uh, death camp um, of, of, of such a horrific magnitude, and, and that they were, they were saying those things. So um, it, I was glad, I mean, it wasn't part of our itinerary, but it was just something as a, somebody who's interested in history, and I hope we all are, because this is very important. You know, I was read, read, I read uh, uh, Stephen E. Ambrose's uh, book, Citizen Soldiers. And in that book, he, he says in his afterword, he says, when I read the letters from the veterans, I'm almost always, or I'm sorry, when I read the letters from the veterans, I'm almost always impressed by their brief accounts 
of what they did with their lives after the war. They had successful careers. They were good citizens and family men. And many of them made great contributions to their society, their country, and the world. Then, I think of those who didn't make it. These men were natural leaders. They died one by one. Of each of them, I wonder, what life was cut off here? A genius, a budding politician, a builder, a teacher, a scholar, a novelist, a musician. I sometimes think the biggest price we pay for war is what might have been. And I think that's always a good question. And I, th I know that in my mind, what might have been if I'd had more conversations with my father, who, oddly enough, passed away six weeks before our trip to Europe. Uh, you know, when, when that, I said that that was a story in and of itself. Uh, when I heard him talking about this, he was president of the 89th Infantry Society. Uh, and, you know, they had uh, uh, regular reunions as long as they possibly could until they, they discontinued the organization formally. Um, and, and I said, well, can anybody go? I asked Dad, can anybody go? And so his conservative nature and certainly his Danish uh, um, heritage came through. He says, yeah, if you pay your own way. <laughs> Still makes me laugh. Yeah, if you pay your own way. So, uh, yeah, I paid my own way. And, um, and I'm glad I made that trip. Because there were things that I found out, possibly, that I would never heard from my dad. Number one, and I think this is very important when we, we see, when we have to transfer our, uh, our, our oral history from one generation to another. Why did he change his name to Johnson? I never asked him. Was it because he survived the war? Or was it because he was so, so thankful to have such a fine home with Henry and Emma Johnson? or a combination of both. But I never asked him directly, you know, why did you change your name? Um, I never knew his thoughts on order. And that was one reason I wanted to go on this trip, was maybe, maybe I'd learned something. I think I did learn some things there um, uh, about uh, the tough fight that they had across the Rhine, um, uh, one of the tougher, tougher fights there and, and uh, to get across. And uh, some of the crossings were, were, were pretty easy. Uh, but he, he, he didn't talk about those things. I wanted to directly ask him, you know, I've noticed you, if you wore the, if you wore the uh, country's uniform, it didn't matter what your political uh, preference was, didn't matter the color of your skin, didn't matter what your religion was, you know, you were due the respect and dignity of a, of a veteran. And I, I think he carried that through, although the Veterans Administration between 69 and 74 was a tumultuous time with all the veterans returning from the Vietnam War, uh, the, the load that that was putting on the system, uh, and, and finally Dad resigned. And it, you know, I mean, was he a scapegoat? Was he just doing what the President asked him to do? You know, I mean, all those things will be sorted out by historians and probably still are. Uh, but he was trying to change the culture of the Veterans Administration, too. And it was very, very hard. You know, a lot of people were saying, well, here's a small town Iowa businessman coming in with some common sense solutions to trying to get veterans the services that they are uh, uh, de deserving of. Uh, and it was hard to break through some of this bureaucracy. And we still see that today. I think one of the lessons from the election was that there are a great number of people in this country who believe that government is, is not doing the things that it should, but is doing things that it shouldn't be doing. And just look at the Veterans Administration. Now, I come from Northwest Iowa. I mean, I live in Northwest Iowa now, and I hear the same thing in Iowa City, um, that um, the services are, 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 are very good. I mean, people are getting the services that they need. Uh, we have a, a hospital in Sioux Falls, and about a half hour east of me is Spirit Lake, and they have a fine clinic there that they can, they can take some of the more minor uh, uh, medical uh, cases. And, and, and I don't hear a lot of complaints about it, but that's not true all across the country. So there, you know, there's, there, there are those things. I mean, he told me a few stories there, but you know, all these things, too, is that you, you hear about uh, uh, things. Now, when, when they were at Ordruff, and trying to sort through this just absolute uh, mess of things there, um, 
Dad did tell me that there was a boy, a Jewish boy, who uh, seemed to appear out of nowhere, always seemed to be close to this, to, to his, uh, um, his detachment. And if somebody said, boy, it'd be nice to have a chocolate bar, you know, it wasn't too long before this boy, you know, answered with a chocolate, you know, came in with a chocolate bar, or I wish I had some paper and, and, and uh, a pencil to, to write a letter home. Those kinds of things would start appearing, and he really attached himself to them. So, I, so Dad comes all the way back to Iowa. He's out at the farm, and they're, ha they're, they're eating, and, and uh, they're having a meal, and this boy shows up. He's, he's immigrated to the United States, and he shows up, and, and, and Dad says, you know, you don't belong here. You know, we, you can't stay here. He kind of wanted to stay. But it was Dad's opinion that he needed to be with his own people. He needed to be with, with other Jew, uh, people of Jewish faith. And they were mostly being resettled in places like Pittsburgh and, and Dallas. Well, uh, he did end up going back to Pittsburgh. And he became a very noted doctor, uh, very successful. Uh, he was very enterprising, obviously, from his childhood on. And he wrote a little short memoir of his visit to Iowa, and, and he talked about being there at the dinner table and the bottomless bowl of potato salad. <laughs> and I, you know, I would submit that only those people who've really known starvation and suffering and abuse can describe it like that as a bottomless bowl of potato salad. So that's something I remember too. So that's kind of a little talk that I had today and just the fact that it is true. I can look out here in the audience and know these veterans and, and the people who came and then got involved in any way, in any way, any volunteer work, any, any, any public office, uh, you know, the list goes on just like uh, Stephen Ambrose has written is that they came back and quietly without a lot of fanfare, rebuilt their communities. They got on the school board, they got on city council, took over uh, the family's business or farm, uh, and those kinds of things. And that's a story that probably isn't told enough either. I worry about losing the oral the connection that we have with people who've gone through the Great Depression and World War II, because there's a lot to be learned there. And, and as far as young people today, I really would, would uh, urge them to know your history, Know the history of this country, of your family, of your community, and um, uh, you know, and, and try to make this a better place. Uh, we're we're really at a crossroads right now, and we really need this more than ever. So that's my talk today, and thank you for being here. And I don't know if there's going to be any questions or any conversation that we want to have on this Veterans Day would be great. Lynn is going to get a portable microphone, so if there's any questions, we'll pass the microphone to you, and uh, just raise your hand, and she's bringing the microphone over to you, sir. Hi, Dave. Somebody from your past, Carrie J. Hi, Carrie. What uh, took you from here out to uh, northwestern Iowa? I've forgotten that part. You forgot that part? I yeah. can smell the cows. Because <laughs> you, you were such a great newspaper. Here. Well, thank you very much. Well, I did work in newspapers. I did work in newspapers in Ottumwa afterward. In Ottumwa, uh, I went to here in South Dakota. I was there for a year. Uh, I was offered a job in Sheldon, uh, Iowa. Uh, and which happens to be the birthplace of Paul McNutt, the late Paul McNutt, who we all know or knew, and a uh, um, great friend of the foundation and of the, of the whole Hoover complex. So, uh, you know, just, it was, I was just out wandering around. <laughs> so I'm up there and uh, I was there three years. I'll tell you this a true story. Uh, I was there three years. I don't know what you know about Northwest Iowa, but uh, far Northwest Iowa. And uh, I decided, somebody asked me to run for the House of Representatives. And during the campaign, a gentleman approached me and said, you're never going to win. It was a three-way primary. Somebody had retired uh, from the House after serving 18 years. And um, I said, really? 
really, you know, okay, so I can't win. Can you tell me why? And he says, I'll give you three reasons. Number one, you're not Dutch. Number two, oh, no, I'm sorry, no, number one, you weren't born here. That's the, that's the most important one. Number two, you're not Dutch. It's a very Dutch area up in Northwest Iowa. And number three, you're one of those suspicious Catholics. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I don't know what that means. So, uh, but I went ahead and won anyway. <laughs> so it wasn't what I was looking for. I, I've grown up around a government. I believe, I believe that you have to govern. And the only way that we're going to be able to solve some of these uh, problems we have, especially problems like the Veterans Administration, uh, with, with what we're dealing with today, um, is, uh, you know, we just have to, we, we have to govern. We can't just be in a, this, this mode of, well, let's just shut the, 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 the thing down. I mean, we can't do that. These are institutions that were, were created as, as um, was noted before again about Herbert Hoover's role in the Veterans Administration that were created to provide these services. And um, the uh, weapons that are being used today are, are just horrific uh, in the damage that they can do. And, and we, we owe it despite the price to our veterans. I really believe that. So, but anyway, that's kind of a long reply to, to that. But I, 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 you know, this is a wonderful place. It was a great place to grow up. I don't think you can find a better place to have a weekly newspaper than West Branch because of this facility here and, and the people that, uh, um, that have come through here. Uh, I remember hold, holding up the front page until Wednesday morning. That's when I'm supposed to print in, the, in Muscatine and Gerald Ford's going to be visiting the library. And I'm, darn it, I'm going to get that picture before the Press Citizen gets it or the Cedar Rapids Gazette for that matter. And, and I did, and, but it was real quick. But you know what I was thinking at the time was that, you know, you know, he hits these golf balls and, and into the crowd and beans people, you know, and things like that. I, you know, I'm just thinking, you know, what if he gets out of the limousine and, and you know, like knocks his head, you know, or something. There's just, just, just something goes wrong. But I got a good picture of him uh, with Richard Norton Smith uh, shaking hands. So it, it held up the front page and I had it first. So. It's a minor little thing, but those are the people that are, you know, that this is a, just a great place and it's getting better all the time. We've, we've had some great directors here. Um, the grounds look beautiful. Um, it's just, uh, it's it just really, I really miss the place. There's one bag. Is that Bob? Yeah. Yeah. David, I was uh, privileged to have known your father and uh, had great respect for him. And I'm just curious as to what you think it was that uh, uh, fostered the great passion that he obviously had for the interests of veterans. Well, certainly his, his working, his, his, you know, from, from post commander uh, to state commander uh, and then to national commander, but even before that, um, uh, it could be a number of things. It, it could be the things that he saw, um, and that you know, knowing that experience, you know, he 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 was uh, received the bronze star, and I never really heard the full story about that, but he apparently took a sniper out, and uh, that was doing some heavy damage to the to the company and. And uh, had them pinned down. So, uh, but all, all of, maybe all those other experiences, just something that was in him, um, and um, I think certainly something that was encouraged by Grandpa Henry Johnson, um, uh, that he he was very encouraging to, to him uh, in terms of him en enlisting and taking part, just as he did during World War One. But you know, I, you know, it's it's hard to. I think it's the camaraderie. That I, I don't really know. I mean, there's other veter there's other veterans here, but you know when they were crossing the Rhine, he was he was in the artillery, and so they put down. I heard from other other people there that they put down a beautiful smoke screen across the river, and the Germans were dug in deep on the other side, and were just waiting for somebody to come across there. And the Rhine is very swift and dangerous, 
And this Ellen Johnson I was talking about, he was the only one in his boat, once it got blasted out of the water, to survive because you get caught in these currents and everything. But they laid down a perfect smoke uh, over the water and a wind came up and exposed all those boats and you just see, you know, you think you've done your job because he, he was in the artillery. You think you've done your job and look what happens. It's out of your control. You know, it's, it's seeing people lose their lives like that and, and you know, I, th I think Every veteran I've ever met is, why wasn't it me? Why, why was it him or her and not me? You know, I think all those things come together where he's, uh, he, he was, you know, just, just very, very passionate about it. You know, and the other thing is, is that he continued to keep his uh, ties with people in the VA, now the Department of Veterans Affairs, but, but uh, keep his ties with that because veterans still called him and asked if he could help. And he did. He did willingly. And then he, then he became very, very ill and, uh, ex and, and passed to a better place on August 10th, 1999. <laughs> August 10th. I th you know, just to me, uh, just incredible. Because uh, he was involved with so many other families that are, you know, here um, in, in, in Getting this established, uh, you know, privately, getting the library established privately, uh, expanding the park area, and all the, all those things, and, and knowing this that this would be a good thing, even though it did wipe out Olson Implement, by the way. I mean, I mentioned Pete Olson, you know, his Implement place got taken out. So there were some changes here that were sometimes difficult, but you know, we're 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 better because of it, I think. Definitely. I don't know if that answers your question, but I really don't know. The important thing is you have to talk to your, you know, to people and, and, and try to get them to, to, to say more than they probably are willing to say, I think. You know, my brother was in Vietnam, he's a Green Beret, and serving up near the Cambodian border. He said two things to me. He said, he was up with the mountain yards, um, the, the, uh, or French for mountain people. Uh, but first was that the Ho Chi Minh Trail was not a trail, it was a highway. Um, we always heard about it as a trail. But the other thing is, a boy, a mountain yard boy, uh, uh, developed a serious infection that was near uh, uh, turning to gangrene. But they are a very primitive people. You know, this is oversimplifying, but the Chinese pushed the Vietnamese down into Viet what's now Vietnam. The Vietnamese then displaced the mountain yard people who are, uh, are up in the hills and the mountains now. Very fiercely independent people. Uh, they're going to fight for their independence. They don't want to be Vietnamese. They don't want to be Chinese. They don't want to be communist. They don't want to be democratic. Just they want to have their lives lived, and it's a very primitive life. So, again, oversimplifying, it would be like taking a green stick, sharpening it, and and lancing that wound and driving out evil spirits to cure that boy. Well, Alan said that the 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 berets sat together for about two hours talking as to whether they would intercede and, and bring the medicine they have, the antibiotics, the things that the boy needed, uh, to help him. They hadn't been able to convince the mountain yards to do that. And they were taking a grave risk because if the boy died, seriously, if the boy died, I mean, the Americans get killed. I mean, they'll be driven out and it'll be a firefight within the hamlet between what should be allies. But, but it's a very, very gradual relationship. Well, they did the American thing. They interceded and they, they saved that boy's life. And I just wonder where, you know, the power of the individual, that image of the individual, just like the survivors of these camps, have a, have a terrific story to tell that we need to remember. And I just sometimes think about, you know, where is that boy today? Um, it, it's, you know, they did the right thing. Uh, but they took a, a, a great risk uh, of doing that. So uh, it was a clash of cultures. It could have been a real clash of cultures. Got a question back. Hey. Uh, John Foster. Yeah, hi, John. I, uh, I remember when your dad was appointed the head of VA. Um, I was working for LBJ down in Texas, and uh, I told uh, this woman associate had been a long time aide of LBJ that I knew Don Johnson. He was now the new head of the VA. And her comment was, well, he's, uh, 
He's not, a, not an officer. He said, this would be the first head of VA that wasn't an officer. Uh, and myself being a, a, an enlisted man, I, uh, I thought, no, that's odd. But it, uh, it, did he ever comment about the fact that... No, no. Not at all. Not that I ever remember. He's a tech sergeant. So, uh, maybe that's, you know, there's nothing, wrong, there's nothing wrong with that. And I think that that's, that's another thing that government needs to think about is, is just, it's not always, you know, it just shouldn't be the same old, same old, same old all the time. This, this, this state, this uh, country is changing and uh, we've got to change with the times too. Any other comments? But I really appreciate all of you being here. I appreciate people for their service. Um, this is, there's a lot going on in Washington, but the most important thing was that uh, I did hear the president uh, speak uh, at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, and uh, it, was, it was a terrific speech, very, 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 very strong, but we've got so much more to do. Um, and I'm just hoping that the new administration uh, will, will provide the direction that the VA needs uh, to, to be an even better agency than it is. But I really do appreciate it and remind everybody too, there's a Veterans Supper at Bethany Lutheran Church uh, uh, too today. And thanks mom for being here and your friends. It's good to see all of you. I mean, these are people, all you know, just everybody here, all very, very important people in my life.